Hi there and welcome to another Bible message. Uh, this one is appropriately entitled The Elephant in the Room. And the elephant in the room that I want to speak about is the when people say the name of Jesus anywhere, it's either offensive to some, and so they tell you, oh no, don't mention that name. Oh. Or it's the basis for religion of many others. And those that believe in Jesus, that he came to the earth as a babe in the manger of Bethlehem, seeing this is Christmas time, this is appropriate. But he was born in Bethlehem and he became a uh, rabbi to the Jews. He used to go into the synagogues on the Sabbath or Saturday and he would preach unbelievable messages and they were astounded by uh, the word that he brought forth from God and the first time he did that was he was age 12, almost 13, bar mitzvah if you will, when Jewish boys become men. Um, so he spoke often in the Holy Temple at Jerusalem. And the same Jesus was expected by my Jewish friends to come into the world as a Messiah. Well, Messiah means not Savior, it means King. One who's going to reign, they thought, with an iron fist and, and get rid of all of this persecution that they were going uh, through uh, from those in charge at Rome. The Romans were in charge over all of the Jews in Israel in Jerusalem in particular. So my Jewish friends said, no, the Messiah is coming, he's coming as king. So to others in the Christian faith, Jesus was going to come as first as Savior, then as Messiah. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. So the, the, when you utter the name Jesus anywhere, you know, most people think politically that it is politically incorrect to say the name Jesus because, you know, some people are just offended by it. Could be my Jewish friends are offended by it. Some of the ones I know, um, and I've, my mentor for one of my business mentors was Jewish, Saul, loved the man. Uh, my business partner in real estate is Jewish. Um, so, no, some of my best friends are Jewish and they are not offended at all if I mention the name Jesus. But there are other people on the planet that are absolutely offended and some, atheists in particular, hate the name of Jesus being mentioned anywhere. They just absolutely hate it. This is not understandable to me why Jesus should be the elephant in the room. It's nibbling on my plant up there. Uh, my, some of the people that I know who are Muslims, they even say Jesus was a great prophet. He's going to return with their prophet Muhammad. And uh, so they respect the name of Jesus, yet many of us don't. Christians who know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, who did trust him as Savior first and then know that he's coming back as king and ruler uh, who will rule from a temple that is yet to be built on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Uh, they know that, but yet, you know what? They're afraid to mention Jesus' name at work, aren't you, in public? And I say aren't you because I was you before December of 2007 when, uh, when I decided, you know what? I want to get on the path that the Lord has led me on to. I want to know what His plan and purpose is for my life. I'm not going to be afraid of anything anymore. And that's the way that it should be. And Jesus, to me, is not the elephant in the room. I'm going to leave him there because he's pretty. And he's my pal. Now, think about this. Anybody can say the name God in any surroundings, 97% of the people on the planet know that there's a supreme being. The other 3%, according to Psalm 53, one, where God says, 
The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, they say there's no God. But aside from that, 97% of the people from, that's all other religions, acknowledge there is a supreme being. They have their own God. So they recognize that there is a supreme being, there is a creator, uh, somebody who organized the earth and put it one degree, uh, if it was one degree closer to the sun, as I pointed out before, we would have burned up. If it was one degree further away from the sun, we would have frozen to death. This couldn't have happened with some cataclysmic bang, the Big Bang Theory. It's stupid to believe that. Yet, they teach this in our public school systems. They teach that, nah, it just happened. Hey, it just happened. Well, it's pretty good just happening. It's an amazing thing that it just happened, that one degree, the planet closer to the sun, we'd have been burnt up. So, I don't know what to tell you. So, naming the name God, no problem. When you mention the name Jesus, it's the elephant in the room. Hey, keep it down, hey, keep it down. We don't want to, you know. But we have to talk about the elephant in the room today. That's why he's here. So, let's first start with this question. Basic question. Did Jesus, the man, forget Savior, Lord, Messiah, did, was there some human being by the name of Jesus, uh, was he born? Did he ever really exist? Well, almost everybody on the planet knows that there are historical books, including this Bible, which is historically accurate, if it were not so, all the brilliant minds out there on the planet would have shot that down years and years ago. They try to burn it, they try to ban it. It's still here. I have one. You have one, no doubt. So, the historical facts found in this book are absolutely accurate. So, did Jesus exist? According to history, yes, he did. Was he born in a little town of Bethlehem, like Christmas carols uh, we sing about? Uh, and was that prophesied at all in the Old Testament? You know, Bethlehem, what's the significance? Why would somebody be born in Bethlehem? Uh, this one called Jesus. Well, historical proof other than the Bible and other historical books is the calendar itself. You realize that? The calendar, uh, Rome used, they got the word calendar, D-A-R, from the word K-A-L-E-N-D-A-E, -E, which was on the first day of every month the Romans would come and collect all the debts due to them and taxes and everything else. First day of every month they collected. So they collected each month that they called on a cal and day or calends, C-A-L-E-N-D-S. So debts were due and books were made to track those payments and they used the books, they called it a calendarium. And from that they derived the word now calendar. So if we move it forward just a bit, we can go all the way to um, the calendar being the year zero. Now, the year zero, let me see if I can find that information. Yes, a uh, Catholic monk by the name of Dion, Dion, Dionysius, yeah, that's it, Dionysius, declared that Jesus' birth was the year zero. Ever since then, the calendar has... Uh, A.D., which means, it's Latin for Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord, the year that the Lord was born in a little town of Bethlehem. And anything that happened before the birth of Christ is called B.C. or before Christ. So, Jesus Christ had to have been born, otherwise, why would the calendar come about with the year, the years being zero, and then A.D., and Domini, some Christians say after death, which is not true because that would have been 33 AD. So it's Anno Domini, year of our Lord, and everything before that, BC. You got it? So the calendar reflects the fact that Jesus was in fact born, and he was in fact a human being born in the town of Bethlehem. Now, uh, Jesus himself claimed to be born of a virgin Jewish girl by the name of Mary. 
And he also claimed that his father was God in heaven. That's where the, my Jewish friends took offense at that because they said, no, that's blasphemy. You can't claim to be God. Uh, nobody can claim to be God. So Jesus worked miracle after miracle. He healed people, gave people their, uh, uh, their sight back. He raised the dead, including Lazarus, which has to be true. Um, but he did that because even today in Jerusalem, there is a temple tomb of Lazarus. And they built several churches around this. And you can go in take 24 steps down into the tomb, and that was the tomb where Lazarus came forth. So a lot of this history is backed up by hard evidence because the tomb is still there. So even then, when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, that his father was not Joseph the carpenter, but was God the Father in heaven, and his mother was Jewish Mary, um, my, the, uh, the Jewish people, uh, Sadducees, Pharisees, those who ruled the temple, uh, just said, no, that's blasphemy, no. So Jesus, right off the bat, became the elephant in the room. King Herod didn't want any competition from another king because the Jews would say, the king is coming, the Messiah, the king, he's going to rule. And King Herod says, nah, we're going to take care of this problem. So Satan threw uh, King Herod declared that all children under the age of two, all man-child, men-child, boy-child, would be killed. That's where Mary, Joseph, the father, and Jesus, and their whole family moved out to Egypt until King Herod died. So all of these things happened around the name Jesus, the elephant in the room. He was an elephant in the room back then, because those who followed the teachings of Jesus called Christians or disciples, followers of Christ, if you will, they were persecuted for naming the name of Jesus. Not unlike today, there are some places in China, you name the name Jesus, you get punished. In the Islamic world, they've mowed them down with machine guns for mentioning the name of Jesus. They hate uh, Christians for some reason, don't know why they... I guess they just do. They respect the name Jesus, but they don't want him being called deity, son of God. So those people were persecuted then, and so they were afraid to mention, not unlike now, the name Jesus for fear of retribution from Rome or from the people that were running the uh, temple in Jerusalem and all throughout Israel. So the next question would be, are there any words then before Jesus? Are there any words out of the Old Testament books, um, which at that point would have been the Septuagint Bible, which was 200 years B.C., which were the 39 books of the Old Testament, written in language that the, uh, the Israelites could understand because they were in captivity until Jesus came back. They were in captivity 400 years. So, are there any words in the Old Testament that would say from a Jewish prophet that a child, a significant being, would be born in the little town of Bethlehem? The answer is yes. Bethlehem goes way back to Genesis chapter 35 where a woman by the name of Rachel, it says she was, she died and it, she died in a place called Bethlehem Judah. It was all one word. Bethlehem, Judah. That's been shortened now to Bethlehem of Judea. Because Judea is a region, Bethlehem is a little city within that region. But that's where it first came up in Genesis, way back in the first book of the Bible, chapter 35. Now, the father of King David, he was around in, I'm going to say, 1057 B.C. 1057 years before Christ was born. See, B.C., calendar, before Christ. King David's father, his name was Jesse, but they called Jesse the Bethlehemite because that's where he lived and was born, in Bethlehem of Judea. So Bethlehem was significant way back then, 1,057 years at least, before the birth of Christ 
in that little town of Bethlehem. Now the Jewish prophet Micah, way back a very respected uh, Jewish prophet who lived in circa 750 BC had this to say, say in, in Micah chapter 2. Watch this. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, the, nation, the area around Bethlehem. Yet a ruler of all Israel will come from you, Bethlehem, one whose origins are from the distant past. So the prophet Micah, now prophets were given a word of knowledge directly from God through a man who spoke to the nation of Israel. In this case it was Micah. And he said, out of Bethlehem will come a Messiah, a king, a ruler of all Israel. That's why my Jewish friends still expect him to come back, because they missed all the Old Testament prophecy about, first he has to come as a savior, as a sacrifice for their sins, my sins, and your sins. They missed all that. I don't know why, but they missed it. Maybe they're just going by Micah, who says, out of Bethlehem shall come a ruler of Israel. Now, Micah, it's strange that he would say, but his origins are from the distant past. What he's saying is the same thing John said in the book of John, which is, in the beginning, there really is no beginning, God always was. God says to Moses, I am, tell him I am sent you. I am connotes the word, I always was, and I always will be. So the I am, according to Micah here, this one born in Israel as a human being, baby, obviously if it's born in Bethlehem, also came from the distant past, came from the beginning, if you will. Micah, the prophet, said that. I don't know how people miss this stuff, but they do. John, that is the, one of the apostles of Jesus, wrote in the book of John, in the beginning was the word, that is, the, this word wasn't developed, you know, until... I mean, the Old Testament was, but the New Testament didn't come around until 95 AD when John finished writing the book of Revelation. So, when all of this was going on and there was no New Testament, in the beginning, John says, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and he says, and the Word was God. And now Micah is saying in the Old Testament, 750 years BC, that the one that's going to be born in the town of Bethlehem came from a distant past. How can this be? That's how it can be, because God would come in the form of man, which would be Jesus, to be with us, because John further states, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what's recorded in history right here. Okay. So the ruler of Israel would come out of Bethlehem. A Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Human flesh, but his origin started in distant past. Got it? Okay. So, yes, the elephant in the room was born in Bethlehem as a baby, but his father was God himself. God said, to Mary, by the way, I want you to name him Jesus, and the angels said, he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So here's a human, born in Bethlehem, God will be with us through him. I don't know how people miss that, and why we can't talk about Jesus, the name Jesus. Real easy to say, doesn't have to be an elephant in the room. Hey, yo, stop eating the plant. Big guy. So, um, he is first coming as a savior, according to most Christians and the, New, the Old Testament, which I'll show you in a minute. He had to come as a savior, and uh, <clears throat> let's read about that by Isaiah, one of the greatest Jewish prophets of the Old Testament. Isaiah says this, and he shall judge among the nations, that's this one born in Bethlehem, and he shall rebuke many people, which he did. He rebuked his own uh, nation of Israel. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. This is talking about when he comes back as king to rule 
out of Mount Zion, out of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. That has not taken place, but it says, He shall then judge and rule all nations on the earth, and shall rebuke many people on the earth, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. In other words, there's not going to be any more wars for a thousand years. Jesus said, I'm coming back the second time. I'm coming back first in the clouds, take my saints away. Three and a half years later, after the second half of the bad tribulation period is over, I'm going to then come back and rule out of Mount Zion, out of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. I'm also going to put Satan in chains for the thousand years. And when he's locked up in the pit, chained for a thousand years, there will, by default, really, no sin, no Satan in the world. There will be peace on earth, goodwill toward men, as was predicted. Remember, I'm reading what Isaiah said. And Isaiah came way B.C. He shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks to go fishing with. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. No more wars for a thousand years. Imagine peace on earth. It's coming. Neither shall they learn war anymore. That's a great thing. That will happen. So what my Jewish friends were saying is a ruler, Messiah, will come. They are right. He is going to come back as the Messiah. But first we have to establish, did he first come as a sacrifice for our sins? Did he first come as a savior? Or was this all, as my Jewish friends would say, Bubba Mainza, which means grandmother's stories. So let's go find out. Did Jewish prophets in the Old Testament predict that the Messiah would first come as a Savior? The answer starts way back with Abraham. The answer is yes. Here's what God said to Abraham, who was not Jewish. I'll tell you why in a second. He said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, Abraham. I will curse everybody who curses you. And here's the important thing. All the people of the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. All the people. How could God say that to Abraham? How could everybody be blessed? Uh, it's real easy. He was saying through Abraham, you will have sons and your offspring will be as the sands of the sea, as the stars in the sky. In other words, you couldn't count them all. And every one of your offspring, starting with Abraham and Sarah made a little mistake. God said, I'm going to give you a son. They didn't want to wait. So Abraham had a child called Ishmael with his wife's handmaiden. Her name was Hagar. So here we go. They have this son, Ishmael. He represents the entire Arab nation today even. Uh, because she was from, she was an Egyptian woman. Then... Thirteen years after that, they had, like God promised them in the first place, but they didn't want to wait, they had a son called Isaac. Isaac had a son called Jacob. The word Jacob means supplanter, which means a guy that manipulates everything around to get his own way. He manipulated his brother Esau's birthright. So after a while, though, he became a very uh, dependent on God himself, like I do now, and God uh, enjoyed Jacob, and he says, from now on, I'm not going to call you Jacob anymore. I'm going to call your name Israel. Through Jacob is where the nation of Israel was born, if you will. So Abraham wasn't Jewish. Isaac wasn't Jewish. They were just righteous people because they believed in God. The Jewish nation came about starting with Yaakov, Jacob, co-named Israel, by God himself. Okay, so you got some history there, no problem. Um, so how would the earth be blessed through Abraham? The Jewish nation came out of Jacob, the Arab nation came out of Abraham uh, also through Isaac and Jacob. Um, and then all of the Gentiles, that's non-Jews, came out of Abraham as well. So every one of us who are alive today on the planet, I don't care where you're from, could be Pakistan, India, Europe, it doesn't matter. 
we all go back to Abraham, one way or another, Gentile or Jew. Um, so then God branched them off, as I say, when Jacob was called of God and said, you're going to be called Israel from now on. Okay. So a Savior would be needed now to be able to bless the nations of the earth. Every person on earth God allowed through Abraham to be born and blessed. Blessed how? With the opportunity to go to heaven for eternity. How? Only through a Savior that would forgive their sins, die on a cross for their sins, and the only one that could forgive their sins. God had to have a blood sacrifice. So God himself actually came in the form of man, Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I know some of you don't buy that, but it's all true in the Bible. God's Spirit dwelled with Moses, came upon Moses. You read about his Spirit, so we know there's two, God, Jehovah, God the Spirit. And then the Old Testament prophesied that God would come in human flesh. God the Son. No matter how you shake a stick at it, if you're into the Old Testament or the New Testament, it makes no difference. It all pointed toward this Jesus, the elephant in the room that everyone's afraid to mention his name, for whatever reason. Okay, Moses, the beloved leader of all of Israel, Moses, the one that brought the Ten Commandments down from the mountain of God, the Ten Commandments, Moses, that led every, the children of Israel through the wilderness, um, that Moses, he predicted way back in the fifth book of the Old Testament, in the five books of Moses, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, Moses had this to say, The Lord, your God, he was talking to the nation of Israel, he wasn't talking to me, the Gentiles, the Lord, your God, that Lord, God right up there in heaven, will raise up for you a prophet. In the future, a prophet is going to be raised up, just like me, Moses said, from among you. He will come out of Israel. From your fellow Israelites, he says, in Deuteronomy 18.15. And Moses said, you must listen to him. Well, when Jesus came, this prophet... Now, Jesus really... Um, was among very few prophets in the New Testament. They prophesied, again, I said this in an old lesson, because they didn't have the New Testament then. So God's word still came through man until uh, the time of John the Baptist, which means until the time of Jesus would be announced, and Jesus would tell his guys, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Apostle Paul, etc., what to write in the New Testament. So we have those books available to us now, but we didn't back then. So anyway, I will raise up a prophet, listen to him. God himself said in the book of Matthew, when he announced Jesus was going to start out in his ministry, he said the same thing Moses did. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Moses is saying in Deuteronomy 18.15, hear ye him when he comes. Yet, most people, they don't want to hear ye him. They don't want to mention his name. King David, a very uh, Jewish king and a prophet of God also, predicted this, that it had to be a savior coming. It had to be somebody that would be sacrificed for our sins before he would come as a Messiah. In the book of Psalms it says this, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst... This is a prophetic statement. He's talking about something that's going to happen through somebody, a man, in the future. And through my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. That's the Old Testament, David, 1057 B.C. Here you go in history, in the New Testament, when they crucified Jesus, the Roman soldiers came up, put a cup like this, I think I'll have some now, only it was vinegar in the cup, and they handed it up to Jesus, the only one that ever is recorded that way, uh, to give him vinegar to drink, just like David prophesied. That's why there were prophets then. God spoke through a man and said, this is what's going to happen 1,057 plus 33 years from now. Whatever that is, 
comes out to. This, so if they gave me vinegar to drink, somebody was being persecuted, and it was Jesus on the cross when this happened. So he had to come first as a savior. It was prophesied in many, many other instances, by the way. Isaiah was pretty direct um, to the Jews also. They needed a sign. So Isaiah, way back in 760 BC, Isaiah, the famous Jewish prophet, predicted this, folks. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, because you all wanted a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. How can this be? A virgin conceiving. And she shall bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This was predicted in 750 B.C. Here we have the year zero, and a virgin conceived, a Jewish virgin by the name of Mary, conceived and bore a son, and his name was called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Folks, I mean, I don't know how to say anything different than, than that's there in the book. I don't know how to make it any clearer. History points to Jesus. In fact, his story is his story. That's where they get the word. His story. The whole thing points to this one called Jesus. You know, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to mention his name. So in fact, a virgin had a son, a Jewish son, coming through the line of Jesse and David, who died on the cross, as predicted, so he must have had to have been a sacrifice before he comes back as Messiah, King. Um, his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He'll be born in Bethlehem, and yeah, I don't know. Jesus, I do know this, should never become our elephant in the room. But today, so many people are afraid to mention the name of Jesus. That reminds me, a fella named Bill Higgins sent me in this little two-page thing. I'm going to read it to you because it shows what's going on today. It's Christmas time, so I want to read you the, the night before Christmas, only a little differently the way this guy spelled it out. It says here, "'Twas the month before Christmas when all through our land, not a Christian was praying nor taking a stand, why the PC police had taken away the reason for Christmas no one could say. The children were told by their schools not to sing about shepherds and wise men and angels and things. It might hurt people's feelings, the teachers would say. December 25th is just a holiday. Yet the shoppers were ready with cash, checks, and credit, pushing folks down on the floor to get it. CDs from Madonna, an Xbox, an iPod. Something was changing, something quite odd. Retailers promoted Ramadan and Kwanzaa in hopes to sell books by Al Franken and Jane Fonda. As targets were hanging their trees upside down, at Lowe's the word Christmas was nowhere to be found. At Kmart and Staples and Pennies and Sears, you won't hear the word Christmas, It'll never touch your ears. Inclusive, sensitive, diversity are words that were used to intimidate you and me. Now Dashiell, that's Senator, now Darden, now Sharpton, meaning Al Sharpton, Wolf Blitzen, on Boxer, on Rather, on Kerry, on Clinton. At the top of the Senate there arose such a clatter to eliminate Jesus in all public matter and we spoke not a word as they took away our faith, forbidden to speak of salvation and grace. The true gift of Christmas was exchanged and discarded. The reason for the season stopped before it started. So as you celebrate winter break under your dream tree, sipping your Starbucks, listen to me. Choose your words carefully, choose what you say, Shout Merry Christmas and not Happy Holiday. Boy, I thought that was appropriate, especially for the name Jesus that they're all trying to get rid of now, the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about the name Jesus. Talk about God, not a problem.
bring up Jesus, all bets are off. So this Savior, this Messiah, would also be given to the Jews first, and they rejected him <clears throat> uh, back in the day. Uh, and then it, he, the same Messiah would be given to the Gentiles. That's why if you are saved today, if you've clicked on the link to find out what salvation means, then you are a non-Jew, you are a Gentile, although many of my Jewish friends actually are called Messianic Jews because they believe that the Messiah has come in the form of, as the prophets, their prophets predicted, as a sacrifice for our sins first. And Isaiah says this in chapter 11 of Isaiah, verse 10. He says, And in, in, in that day, that's a day in the future, there shall be a root of Jesse. Jesse was David's father, an offspring of Jesse. He shall stand as a sign of all the people, and to it the Gentiles will seek. And his rest shall be glorious. In other words, we can rest in the name Jesus. Jesus will be given to the Jews first, then the Gentiles, which is true. So Jesus did in fact historically come through the line of Jesse through King David, as was predicted through Solomon, all the way to the year zero, when Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem. Now Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. He claimed to have been the Son of God, which I believe that He absolutely is. And I believe He's the only one who can save us from our sins. Therefore, as God promised Abraham, I, the Gentile, am blessed through Abraham. And my Jewish friends were blessed through Abraham as well. Because everyone on the planet was given and is still given the opportunity to inherit eternal life in heaven with the same God who wants a relationship with with you. So, Jesus died on the cross. I say he died, history says he died, but now comes that pesky little thing called resurrection. Cheers. Was Jesus really raised from the dead? Well, according to history again, 515 people saw Jesus die on the cross for your sins and mine on Friday, and on Sunday, they all saw him again. How can this be? He walked, in, he walked down the road to Emmaus with two guys, Cleophas and some unnamed person in the Bible. He appeared to Mary Magdalene in the garden of uh, Geth, in, in the garden, the, the garden tomb, where the tomb was. In that garden, he appeared and talked with and spoke to Mary Magdalene. He then appeared before his eleven remaining disciples, Judas had hung himself, in the upper room walking through a door, but he proved he was still uh, flesh as well because he ate fish with them. See, I can eat fish. Look, it's me, Jesus. I told you guys I was going to be resurrected on the third day. In fact, you guys were with me when I raised Lazarus out of that tomb a week before I went to the cross. If I could raise Lazarus from the dead folks, don't you think that I could raise, be raised from the dead myself? No. So 500 people, in addition to the three on the road to Emmaus, Mary Magdalene, his 11 apostles and others, over 500 people saw, 515 saw Jesus after his resurrection. Now here's another, to me, it's a proof. All the people who wrote this book, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, some were his apostles. Now, if you knew, and the, the synagogue then said, if you mention the name Jesus again, the elephant in the room, you are going to be beaten, persecuted, jailed, maybe even killed. Knowing this, if you served Jesus and you were his apostle and you saw him die on that cross and then let's say you didn't really see him on Sunday, you made it all up, you went in the tomb and you stole his body like they try to push it off on the public, then why would you risk your life? Peter was, was uh, hung on a cross upside down. Uh, others were beheaded. They claimed Paul the Apostle was beheaded. Why would you do this? In fact, Paul the Apostle came about after Jesus died, after he was resurrected, never saw Jesus except in a vision 
on the road to Damascus, he was the Jewish Pharisee who persecuted Christians. He threw them in jail, had them killed like Stephen, was stoned in the middle of the road for uttering the name Jesus, the elephant in the room that nobody wanted to talk about. And this same Apostle Paul that never physically saw Jesus, why would he be writing the book of Corinthians, uh, Romans, the book of Timothy, and a whole bunch of Ephesians, Galatians, why would he go about promoting the gospel of this one called Jesus Christ, knowing that he was going to be persecuted, jailed, and or killed for doing it? Would you do it? Come on. Yeah, well, they were probably martyrs, and you know. No, nobody's that stupid. Come on, come on, be logical with me. Would you be that stupid? Yet they all went out and preached the gospel after Jesus was resurrected. He spent 40 days later uh, with his apostles. Then he ascended into heaven. And while he was with them for the 40 days, he was teaching them what to write in what we now call the New Testament. Because remember, there were no books, no Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Nothing when Jesus went to heaven. So he told them all what to write. And he said, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit back. He will counsel you. He will show you what to write. As God the Father did with the writers of the books like Moses who wrote Genesis. I know a lot of people don't have it. I figured it. Adam must have written it. But all the Old Testament prophets, God spoke through them and had them write the books. Book of Psalms by David. Uh, the book of Proverbs by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. This was God working through them to write the Old Testament. Jesus working through his guys to write the New Testament. Are you with me so far? We're about ready to end this, by the way. So was he raised from the dead? Absolutely proven by over 515 witnesses. Uh, the great prophet Isaiah, again in 760 B.C., said that the Savior would come first to the Jews, as I pointed out a minute ago, then to the Gentiles. He said this, It is a light thing, that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, that would be Israel, and to restore the preserved people of Israel, which he did. I will also give you a light to the Gentiles, that would be the same Jesus, that you may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. All he's saying is that Jesus would be with and bless those who came down through the loins of Abraham, just like God first promised. That everyone on the earth has a chance to accept this one, this Messiah, who's coming as a Messiah and King, and first had to come as a Savior to save us from that lake of fire. So we have to trust Him as Lord and Savior. You can do that by clicking on the link below, and that will bring you over to the salvation page. Then, once you trust God's Son as the one that everything, including the calendar, revolves around, you know, the elephant in the room, then once you learn to say His name and accept Him as your Lord and Savior, you are promised the blessing that Abraham was promised through his loins, we would be blessed, all the people of the earth. And here we are. Okay, of course my alarm's going off, it's 5 p.m. right now. Um, so, let me continue. Jeremiah, the great prophet, Jewish prophet, also claimed that a Messiah would come, rule the earth as king, Lord of lords. He would operate out of the temple on Mount Zion. There is no temple there. It was destroyed in 70 AD. So he said this would happen. Uh, you ask me, when will this be fulfilled? And I've already pointed it out in so many of these lessons, so I'm going to nutshell this one. But in the Old Testament prophet, uh, prophetic book of Haggai, H-A-G-G-A-I, -G -G chapter 2, verse 7, it says this, I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, that is the Messiah, and I will fill this house with glory, what house? The holy temple on Mount Zion, it's not there yet. It says the Lord Almighty, a holy temple will be built on Mount Zion, and again, I've stated this many times, let me nutshell it. There's no temple there now. The Arabs in control, are in control of Mount Zion. Something has to take place to where the Arabs will leave. That happens because of 
Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, his only goal in life is to kill the Jews, drive them to the sea. The Jews know it. You see it in the news today. You hear it all the time. Iran is coming up with nukes. They're never going to use it according to the New Testament here and the Old Testament. So I'm just saying out loud, you guys in Iran, ain't going to happen. Israel is always going to stand. You're never going to destroy it. It's there. God said it. I believe him over what I believe Ahmadinejad is going to say. But Ahmadinejad is driven, ideologically driven, to usher in his 12th Imam, his Islamic Messiah. That's his goal. To do that, he's got to uh, wipe out Israel. Okay, Israel's not going to stand around for that, as I said before. So they're going to do a preemptive strike on Iran. The devastation will be such that it will be all over the news. You'll see it, I'll see it, we'll all see it. Then, as I've already proven in other messages, Israel is already planning and prepared for and have all the artifacts already made for the Holy Temple that is going to be built. So, folks, when you see the Holy Temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem being built, when you see the first stone, the first foundation stone being put in place, you got about, in my opinion, about three and a half years left before Jesus comes in the clouds, takes his saints away, goes to heaven for three and a half years, then returns, as the Old Testament said, as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, as Messiah, as the King who will rule the nations of the earth from that holy temple that is not yet built in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Um, so again, when you see the first stone, you'll say, John Tyler, I remember you little rascal, you, you had this peg right out of God's word. You pegged it right. Here it is, it's happening right before my eyes. And then you'll maybe come back here, click on the link. I'll be gone. So I'll see you guys next week. I appreciate you stopping by. Say goodbye to my friend here. I'll have to give him a few peanuts on the way out the door. That elephant cost me a ton of money to get him in here. We'll see you later there, buddy. All right? Right. I'll see you next week.